Industrialist Charles M. Schwab wrote, To carry on a successful business, a man must have imagination. He must see things as in a vision, a dream of the whole thing. Imagination plays a far more important role in our lives than most of us realize. I have seen this demonstrated many times in my practice. A particularly memorable instance concerned a patient who was literally forced to visit my office by his family. He was a man of about forty, unmarried, who held down a routine job during the day and kept to himself in his apartment when the workday was over, never going anywhere, never doing anything. He'd had many such jobs and never seemed able to stay with any of them for any great length of time. His problem was that he had a rather large nose and ears that protruded a little more than normal. He considered himself ugly and funny-looking. He imagined that the people he came into contact with during the day were laughing at him and talking about him behind his back because he was so odd. His imaginings grew so strong that he actually feared going out into the business world and moving among people. He hardly felt safe, even in his own home. The poor man even imagined that his family was ashamed of him because he was peculiar-looking, not like other people. Actually, his facial deficiencies were not serious. His nose was of the classical Roman type, and his ears, though somewhat large, attracted no more attention than those of thousands of people with similar ears. In desperation, his family brought him to see me to see if I could help him. I saw that he did not need surgery, only an understanding of the fact that his imagination had wrought such havoc with his self-image that he had lost sight of the truth. He was not really ugly. People did not consider him odd and laugh at him because of his appearance. His imagination alone was responsible for his misery. His imagination had set up an automatic negative failure mechanism within him, and it was operating full blast to his extreme misfortune. Fortunately, after several sessions with him, and with the help of his family, he was able gradually to realize that the power of his own imagination was responsible for his plight, and he succeeded in building up a true self-image and achieving the confidence he needed by applying creative imagination rather than destructive imagination. You might say he needed emotional surgery, not physical surgery, with an actual scalpel. This is an analogy for the experiences of thousands of people, quite possibly in one way or another, including you. No, you may not feel ashamed of your nose or ears or any other physical feature, and you may not be a recluse, but many people believe there is something about them that causes others to look down on them, to ridicule them behind their backs, to reject them, something that prevents them from progressing in certain ways. One of the smartest, most successful, and prolific idea men I've ever known in the advertising field has had a lifelong pattern of rising to high income, then suddenly experiencing circumstances that pull the rug out from under him so that he must rebuild from scratch his reputation and his finances. One month he was living in a mansion, the next in a motel. He has admitted to me and to others that he has spent his entire life trying to escape the iron-fisted grip of what he calls his white trash ancestry, and to paraphrase Al Pacino in one of the Godfather movies, just as he gets out, he is again pulled back. Of course, this thing that keeps pulling him back does not exist in the physical world, only inside his own self-image. It's his ugly nose and big ears. What's yours? Ironically, even though his entire business is the imagination business, he has yet to discover how to use his imagination as a scalpel in emotional surgery to rid his self-image of its big nose. Creative imagination is not something reserved for the poets, the philosophers, the inventors. It enters into our every act. Imagination sets the goal picture that our automatic mechanism works on. We act or fail to act not because of will, as is so commonly believed, but because of imagination. This is the most important statement to be gleaned from this entire program. Human beings always act and feel and perform in accordance with what they imagine to be true about themselves and their environment. You cannot long escape or outperform that picture. You can dissect it, analyze it, uncover what is in it that is not true about yourself, and alter it. You can modify it without archaeological examination of the past, but you cannot escape it. You will always act and perform and experience appropriate results in accordance with what you imagine to be true about yourself 
and your environment. This is a basic and fundamental law of mind. It is the way we are built. When we see this law of mind graphically and dramatically demonstrated in a hypnotized subject, we are prone to think that there is something occult or supernormal at work, or to discredit it as simple stage illusion. Actually, what we are witnessing often is the normal operating process of the human brain and nervous system. For example, if a good hypnotic subject is told that she is at the North Pole, she will not only shiver and appear to be cold, her body will react just as if she were cold, and goose pimples will develop. The same phenomena have been demonstrated on wide-awake college students by asking them to imagine that one hand is immersed in ice water. Thermometer readings show that the temperature drops in the treated hand. Tell a hypnotized subject that your finger is a red-hot poker, and he will not only grimace with pain at your touch, but his cardiovascular and lymphatic systems will react just as if your finger were a red-hot poker and produce inflammation and perhaps a blister on the skin. In one demonstration, when college students, wide awake, have been told to imagine that a spot on their foreheads was hot, temperature readings documented an actual increase in skin temperature. These are elementary experiments just one step away from the rather cruel but common children's game, the practical joke played at school and sometimes by adults at work. In this prank, a person is secretly targeted by the group. Then one person after another engages the target in conversation, asking, Aren't you feeling well, Bob? You look pretty white-faced. Bob, are you feeling all right? Soon, poor Bob is in the restroom, checking himself out in the mirror. Before long, Bob is feeling queasy and weak. Bob may even actually become so sick he must lie down or go home. Your nervous system cannot tell the difference between an imagined experience and a real one. Your nervous system reacts appropriately to what you think or imagine to be true. This phenomenon that can be produced as a practical joke or by a hypnotist on stage for entertainment is actually identical to, or illustrative of, the basic process that governs much of our behavior and that can be taken hold of and deliberately used to advantage. In the 1950s, Dr. Theodore Xenophon Barber conducted extensive research into the phenomena of hypnosis. Writing in the January 1958 issue of Science Digest, he said, We found that hypnotic subjects are able to do surprising things only when convinced that the hypnotist's words are true statements. When the hypnotist has guided the subject to the point where he is convinced that the hypnotist's words are true statements, the subject then behaves differently because he thinks and believes differently. The phenomena of hypnosis have always seemed mysterious, because it has always been difficult to understand how belief can bring about such unusual behavior. It always seemed as if there must be something more, some unfathomable force or power at work. However, the plain truth is that when a subject is convinced that he is deaf, he behaves as if he is deaf. When he is convinced that he is insensitive to pain, he can undergo surgery without anesthesia. The mysterious force or power does not exist. Unquote. Note that his comments were published in 1958. Today, hypnosis as a tool of therapy is widely accepted and used. For many, hypnosis and self-hypnosis to facilitate weight loss makes the surgical quick fix of liposuction unnecessary. A perfect analogy to my examples of emotional surgery versus actual surgery. In these cases, hypnosis is the scalpel. In dentistry, hypnosis is used to facilitate treatment of the phobic patient with virtually uncontrollable anxiety and, in many instances, proves to be a perfectly successful alternative to the problematic solution of anesthesia. With regard to the links between childhood programming, past experiences, and peer programming on one hand, and the imagination, the self-image, and the servo mechanism on the other, my conclusion is that people are literally hypnotized by their own self-images. In fact, many people virtually sleepwalk through their entire lives under unrecognized hypnotic suggestion. In Quentin Reynolds' book, Intuition, Your Secret Power, a hypnotist is quoted as saying, Clients visit me hoping that I will put them in a trance and fix their lives. In fact, many of them live in a trance and need a dose of reality. Unquote. 
If you are stuck in a dark elevator for a couple of frightening hours as a child, you may still be fearful of elevators, unable to get into an elevator 40 years later. Regardless of all the safety statistics, factual information, demonstration, observation of thousands using elevators, or even the daunting task of hiking up a dozen flights of stairs, you are still in the hypnotic trance from 40 years ago. Still, a little reflection will show why it is a very good thing for us that we do feel and act according to what we believe or imagine to be true. All of this does not mean the system itself is bad. It only requires learning how to better use the system. The human brain and nervous system are engineered to react automatically and appropriately to the problems and challenges in the environment. For example, a man does not need to stop and think that self-survival requires that he run if he meets a grizzly bear on a trail. He does not need to decide to become afraid. The fear response is both automatic and appropriate. First, it makes him want to flee. The fear then triggers bodily mechanisms that soup up his muscles so that he can run faster than he has ever run before. His heartbeat is quickened. Adrenaline, a powerful muscle stimulant, is poured into the bloodstream. All bodily functions not necessary to running are shut down. The stomach stops working and all available blood is sent to the muscles. Breathing is much faster and the oxygen supply to the muscles is increased many-fold. All of this, of course, is nothing new. Most of us learned this in high school. What we have not been so quick to realize, however, is that the brain and nervous system that reacts automatically to environment is the same brain and nervous system that tells us what the environment is. The reactions of the man meeting the bear are commonly thought of as due to emotion rather than to ideas. Yet it was an idea information received from the outside world and evaluated by the mind that sparked the so-called emotional reactions. Thus, it was basically idea or belief that was the true causative agent, rather than emotion, which came as a result. In short, the man on the trail reacted to what he thought, believed, or imagined the environment to be. The messages brought to us from the environment consist of nerve impulses from the various sense organs. These nerve impulses are decoded, interpreted, and evaluated in the brain and made known to us in the form of ideas or mental images. In the final analysis, it is these mental images that we react to. Note that I've used the terms thought, believed, and imagined as synonymous. In affecting your entire system, they are the same. You act and feel not according to what things are really like, but according to the image your mind holds of what they are like. You have certain mental images of yourself, your world, and the people around you, and you behave as though these images were the truth, the reality, rather than the things they represent. Suppose, for example, that the man on the trail had not met a real bear, but a movie actor dressed in a bear costume. If he thought and imagined the actor to be a bear, his emotional and nervous reactions would have been exactly the same. Or suppose he met a large, shaggy dog, which his fear-ridden imagination mistook for a bear. Again, he would react automatically to what he believed to be true concerning himself and his environment. It follows that if our ideas and mental images concerning ourselves are distorted or unrealistic, then our reaction to our environment will likewise be inappropriate. Can these causative factors change? Certainly. How does a person change? Now consider the child raised in a poor family, made up of people who profoundly believe that their unhappy circumstances are the fault of evil rich people and a corrupt government, who constantly program the child with class warfare ideas, and who insist that they just cannot get ahead no matter what they do. This truth may very well block that person's academic achievement, direct him away from college, have him blindly follow his father to work in the factory or the coal mine, well, I show my age with coal mine, I suppose, yet even today the basic path of accepting poverty as fact is prevalent in many, many people. But how does one person rise out of such a background to become a highly successful entrepreneur, for example? Through books he's exposed to, people he sees on television, the influence of a mentor, life experiences, one way or another, challenging what he believed to be true, discovering it is based on illusion, and replacing that truth with another truth. You can change from anything to anything by changing your self-image, by providing it with new truth. From fat and flabby to fit and strong, 
from mousy and timid to assertive and confident, from clumsy and awkward to capable and graceful. New evidence, actual experiential evidence, and or vividly imagined synthetic evidence, and or reinforcement from other authoritative influencers convinces the self-image. In turn, it relays the appropriate new directives to your servo mechanism, and a new truth exists. A new reality occurs. Why not imagine yourself successful? Realizing that our actions, feelings, and behavior are the result of our own images and beliefs gives us the lever that psychology has always needed for changing personality. It opens a powerful psychological door to gaining skill, success, and happiness. Mental pictures offer us an opportunity to practice new traits and attitudes which otherwise we could not do. This is possible because, again, your nervous system cannot tell the difference between an actual experience and one that is vividly imagined. If we picture ourselves performing in a certain manner, it is nearly the same as the actual performance. Mental practice is as powerful as actual practice. When I first made this assertion, and when others began making it, it was a radical idea that you could practice in your imagination and achieve comparable results to actual physical practice. Today it is widely accepted, having been proved by countless trials and experiments. Athletes of every stripe routinely rely on mental or imagination practice. For example, consider Dr. Richard Koop's advice to golfers as follows, quote, Before you play any shot, you need to have a mental picture of how you want the ball to react once you deliver the club head to the ball. You need to have a definite, positive visualization of what your shot will look like. The picture should indicate the trajectory, the direction, the spot where you intend the ball to land, and how far you want the ball to roll when it lands. If the flight of a shot is difficult for you to picture, try visualizing a strip of highway that curves in the manner you wish your ball to travel. Your options in this visualization are limited only by your imagination. You might see the green as a pincushion ready to accept your shot. Pick visual images that work for you. Visualization is one of the most individual aspects of golf psychology. Unquote. Jack Nicholas has said, I never hit a golf shot without having a sharp picture of it in my head. First I see where I want the ball to finish. Then I see it going there, its trajectory and landing. The next scene shows me making the swing that will turn the previous images into reality. Unquote. Take note of the striking similarities between the Golden Bear's description of what he actually does, Dr. Koop's instructions, and the instructions in this program. It is important to understand that imagination practice need not be restricted to your golf or tennis swing. The same principles of mental practice apply to virtually anything, including broader behaviors, such as speaking up confidently and asserting your opinions in business meetings versus remaining intimidated and silent and regretting it later, or directly asking prospects for orders rather than leaving sales presentations hanging with wimpy, vague endings, and so on. Jack Nicholas uses the word scene. He is playing out his successful shot as a little mental movie, literally stepping out of actual play and into the theater of the mind to watch the movie, then stepping back out to experience the déjà vu effect. In a July 2000 article in Golf Magazine, Jack Nicholas said, The more deeply you ingrain what I like to call my going-to-the-movies discipline, the more effective you will become at hitting the shots you want to hit, unquote. In his four-step process, in step four, he even says, Select the club that the completed movie tells you is the right one. Remarkably, Jack Nicholas has found his way to virtually the same mental movies technique I prescribe even going so far as to turn the pesky details of correct club selection over to his automatic success mechanism, rather than attempting conscious choice. I say remarkably, because, as far as I know, Mr. Nicholas has never read Psycho-Cybernetics, although he has likely been influenced by the many other golfers and golf coaches who have. However, it's really not all that remarkable, since it seems almost all peak performers find their way to this technique one way or another. In a few moments, we'll talk more about the specifics of these mental movies. Let me first tell you about some of the scientific documentation that supports the entire idea of imagination practice. In one of the first controlled experiments I read about, psychologist R.A. Vandal 
proved that mental practice in throwing darts at a target, wherein the person sits for a period each day in front of the target and imagines throwing darts at it, improves aim just as much as actually throwing darts. Research Quarterly reported an experiment on the effects of mental practice on improving skill in sinking basketball free throws. One group of students actually practiced throwing the ball every day for 20 days and were scored on the first and last days. A second group was scored on the first and last days and engaged in no sort of practice in between. A third group was scored on the first day, then spent 20 minutes a day imagining that they were throwing the ball at the goal. When they missed, they would imagine that they corrected their aim accordingly. The first group, which actually practiced 20 minutes every day, improved in scoring 24%. The second group, which had no sort of practice, showed no improvement. The third group, which practiced only in their imagination, improved in scoring 23%. This particular experiment has been widely reported and referenced and since repeated at many universities over the years. Of course, none of this is infallible. After all, Shaquille O'Neal's problem with foul shots remains a mystery. However, while an inexact science, the use of imagination practice is nevertheless an effective science, a proven and practical means of improving skills or altering embedded truths in order to alter behavior. Mental pictures are powerful medicine. K. Porter, Ph.D., and Judy Foster, authors of The Mental Athlete, Inner Training for Peak Performance, provided an excellent detailed prescription for relieving pain and accelerating recovery from injury. In an article in Tennis World magazine, they noted, an important element of self-healing is a mental image that projects a positive future outcome. This visualization stimulates your mind and body and creates an intention to heal. Through mental imagery, it is possible to alter the body's autonomic physiological responses. When you use imagination, mental pictures, and suggestion, you can communicate with your body and make it respond." Unquote. Make no mistake, this is medical scientific truth not mumbo-jumbo. If every hospital patient and every person entering physical rehabilitation were given a copy of Psycho-Cybernetics, they would be considerably better off. Keep this in mind if you ever have a loved one or friend in such circumstances. Mental pictures can help you sell at a higher level. In his book, How to Make $25,000 a Year Selling, Charles B. Roth told how a group of salespeople in Detroit who tried a new idea increased their sales 100%. Another group in New York increased their sales by 150%. And individual salespeople using the same idea had increased their sales up to 400%. And what is this magic that accomplishes so much for salespeople? To quote Mr. Roth's book, It is something called role-playing, and you should know about it, because if you will let it, it may help you to double your sales. What is role-playing? Well, it is simply imagining yourself in various sales situations, then solving them in your mind, until you know what to say and what to do whenever the situation comes up in real life. The reason why it accomplishes so much is that selling is simply a matter of situations. One is created every time you talk to a customer. He says something or asks a question or raises an objection. If you always know how to counter what he says or answer his question or handle the objection, you make sales. A role-playing salesman at night when he is alone will create these situations. He will imagine the prospect throwing the widest kind of curves at him. Then he will work out the best answer to them. No matter what the situation is, you can prepare for it beforehand by means of imagining yourself and your prospect face-to-face -face while he is raising objections and creating problems and you are handling them properly. Unquote. I suspect Mr. Roth's book is now out of print, the $25,000 in its title telegraphs its age. But countless sales books, sales training programs, and professional sales trainers have since incorporated this idea into their methods and advice to sales professionals. In fact, if you are engaged in the field of selling, you've undoubtedly participated in actual role-playing in the classroom, in the seminar room, or at a sales meeting, and may have then practiced with a colleague or a spouse. Use mental pictures to get a better job. The late William Moulton Marston, well-known psychologist, recommended what he called rehearsal practice to men and women who came to him for help in job advancement. If you have an important interview coming up, 
such as making an application for a job, his advice was, plan for the interview in advance. Go over in your mind all the various questions that are likely to be asked. Think about the answers you're going to give. Then rehearse the interview in your mind. Even if none of the questions you have rehearsed come up, the rehearsal practice will still work wonders. It gives you confidence. And even though real life has no set lines to be recited like a stage play, rehearsal practice will help you to ad-lib and react spontaneously to whatever situation you find yourself in because you have practiced reacting spontaneously. This should come as no surprise based on everything I just had to say about mental rehearsal for sales professionals. In a job interview, you are selling yourself. You are the product and its sales representative. Like the negotiator, you may even have the luxury of time, several weeks, maybe even several months, to plan and prepare to search for a new or better position. If so, by all means use it to your advantage by using your imagination to construct and rehearse the perfect job interview so that when the actual interviews take place, you'll be relaxed, confident, and comfortable. A concert pianist practices in his head. Arthur Schnabel, the world-famous concert pianist, took lessons for only seven years. He hated practice and seldom practiced for any length of time at the actual piano keyboard. When questioned about his small amount of practice, as compared with other concert pianists, he said, I practice in my head. C.G. Kopp of Holland, a recognized authority on teaching piano, recommended that all pianists practice in their heads. A new composition, he says, should be first gone over in the mind. It should be memorized and played in the mind before ever touching fingers to the keyboard. Practicing in the head has actually become the basis for quite a bit of modern piano instruction. Composer, performer, and instructor Patty Carlson achieved considerable fame promoting her How to Play Piano Overnight video program in which she teaches people how to feel the music rather than learning to read sheet music and engage in tedious practice. Imagination practice can lower your golf score. I've already mentioned the great Jack Nicklaus's mental rehearsal as just one example. Time magazine reported that when Ben Hogan was playing in a tournament, he mentally rehearsed each shot just before making it. He made the shot perfectly in his imagination, felt the club head strike the ball just as it should, felt himself performing the perfect follow-through, and then stepped up to the ball and depended on what he called muscle memory to carry out the shot just as he imagined it. Ben Hogan was ahead of the curve of modern golf psychology, which has become an industry unto itself and is largely based on visualization and relaxation techniques. Alex Morrison, perhaps the best-known golf instructor in the world at the time I was writing the first edition of this book, actually worked out a system of mental practice to improve your golf score while sitting in an easy chair and practicing mentally what he called the seven Morrison keys. According to Morrison, the mental side of golf represents 90% of the game, the physical side 8%, and the mechanical side 2%. In his book, Better Golf Without Practice, Morrison told how he taught Lou Lair to break 90 for the first time with no actual practice whatsoever. Morrison had Lair sit in an easy chair in his living room and relax while he demonstrated for him the correct swing and gave a brief lecture on the Morrison keys. Lair was instructed to engage in no actual practice on the links, but instead spend five minutes each day relaxing in his easy chair, visualizing himself attending to the keys correctly. Morrison goes on to report how several days later, with no physical preparation whatever, Lair joined his regular foursome and amazed them by shooting nine holes in an even par 36. The core of the Morrison system is, you must have a clear mental picture of the correct thing before you can do it successfully. Morrison, by this method, enabled many celebrities to chop as many as 10 to 12 strokes off their scores. Clearly see the target and let your automatic success mechanism take care of the details. Johnny Bulla, a well-known professional golfer, wrote an article in which he said that having a clear mental image of just where you wanted the ball to go and what you wanted it to do was more important than form in golf. Most of the pros, said Bulla, have one or more serious flaws in their form, yet they manage to shoot good golf. 
It was Buller's theory that if you picture the end result, see the ball going where you want it to go, and have the confidence to know that it was going to do what you wanted, your subconscious would take over and direct your muscles correctly. If your grip was wrong and your stance not in the best form, your subconscious would still take care of that by directing your muscles to do whatever was necessary to compensate for the error in form. This describes the payoff of mastering these techniques, that you reach a point of efficiency where you can simply, quickly, hand a clear picture of the desired outcome over to your servo mechanism and let it take care of the mechanical details of making that outcome take place. Golf is such an excellent laboratory for these techniques because unlike many other sports, it is stripped down to pure competition with yourself. Morrison's coaching of Lair exclusively with mental practice came many years before Tim Galway, author of The Inner Game of Tennis, accepted the challenge of an experiment to see how much golf he could learn just by adapting the inner game, that is, mental skills he had developed in playing and coaching tennis. He set the goal of breaking 80 while playing only once weekly, receiving no technical instruction and otherwise relying on practice in his imagination, in one year or less. At that time, he played only several times a year, scoring between 95 and 105. His diary of that experiment is included in his book, The Inner Game of Golf. His book is well worth reading whether you have any interest in golf or not, as it is a thoroughly detailed case history in the triumph of mind over mechanics or technical information. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of working with many top golfers and golf instructors, although professional discretion requires me to maintain confidentiality for most of them. Some engineered improvement in their performance with only this program and no other assistance from me. Here's one that is public knowledge. In 1964, Dave Stockton was struggling to survive on the pro tour. Overall, I was playing well, but my putting was lousy, Stockton told an L.A. Times reporter. My father, a retired pro, insisted my putting problems were mental, not physical. Dave Stockton beat Arnold Palmer in that event and went on to enjoy a long and successful career. In fact, he became famous for his putting. And 22 years later, Dave won the 1996 U.S. Senior Open. The Real Secret of Mental Picturing Successful men and women have, since the beginning of time, used mental pictures and rehearsal practice to achieve success. Napoleon, for example, practiced soldiering in his imagination for many years before he ever went on an actual battlefield. Webb and Morgan, in their book Making the Most of Your Life, tell us that the notes Napoleon made from his readings during these years of study filled, when printed, 400 pages. He imagined himself as a commander and drew maps on the island of Corsica showing where he would place his calculations with mathematical precision, unquote. Conrad Hilton imagined himself operating a hotel long before he ever bought one. As a boy, he used to play that he was a hotel operator. His earliest successes were in buying dilapidated dowager properties and restoring their beauty, rebirthing them as first-class properties. He said that when he spotted such a property to acquire, he ceased seeing its actual condition, instead forming a vividly detailed collection of photographs in his mind of the hotel as it would appear after its makeover. By seeing what would be, he saw value invisible to others. A strong mental picture can pull you toward success even when you have no logical argument for it. Jane Savoy is one of the most respected horse riding coaches in America. In 2000, she coached the U.S. Olympic equestrian team competing in Sydney. She describes an instance in which imagination power superseded probabilities. Quote, Take, for example, my experience at the screening trials for the North American Championships in 1989. I had a whole bunch of facts that supported the improbability of my doing well at the screening trials. I did have a top horse, Zapatero, but the other facts were, one, Zapatero was new to me and we had not had time to develop a solid relationship and real communications. Two, he was a young horse and not yet strong enough to do what was required. These facts made it difficult to imagine the perfect test, so I visualized the awards ceremony instead. Several times over the course of the day, I would find a quiet spot, close my eyes, relax, and visualize leading the victory lap. In the process, I stopped thinking about the facts and thus prevented doubts and insecurities from creeping in. 
When the results were posted, Zapatero and I were, in fact, there to lead the lap of honor. It sounds incredible, and I in no way minimize the necessity for all the preparation and hard work involved, but mentally zeroing in on desired results as if they were already in existence was a significant factor in our ultimate success. It was important to focus on a positive outcome as a foregone conclusion, rather than allow my rather vivid imagination to conjure up failure pictures. My mind could then supply the means to achieve my goal by helping me to ride skillfully and effectively. Unquote. Even a single, simple, vividly imagined picture of successful achievement can be sufficient to block out doubts, fears, insecurities, and worries and direct the success mechanism to the desired target. Full-scale mental rehearsal is even more powerful. There is simply no sensible case to be made anymore against incorporating mental rehearsal into your own daily regimen. Whether you are a pro or weekend athlete, sales professional, entrepreneur, executive, schoolteacher, doctor, whatever, the evidence mandates that you learn to use this tool and do so regularly for a myriad of productive purposes. It is fair to insist that if you are not utilizing this approach, you are operating without benefit of one of the fundamental, universal, most relied on psychological tools of success we know of. It is much like being a carpenter choosing to operate without benefit of electric power and power tools. You could, but why? <laughs>